Hi, I'm Sneed Collard, author of about a hundred books for young people, including Beaks, Woodpeckers Drilling Holes and Bagging Bugs, and my newest book, Birds of Every Color. I'm here today with my son Braden at the spectacular Lee Metcalf National Wildlife Refuge. Why? Because we want to help get you started on one of the most fun activities you're ever going to do birding. And we picked a wonderful day for it here, early April. Not only are there tons of migratory birds coming through, but they're doing a lot of very interesting things behind us. In fact, our goal today is to introduce you to about 21 common bird species that you can see not only here in Montana where we live, but almost anywhere in the United States. Before we do that though, I want to share with you a couple reasons why birding is so much fun. Raise your hands if you like animals. Uh, I thought so. I mean, humans are animals, so it makes sense that we would take an interest in all of the other animals around us. The thing is, Braden and I have found two problems with watching other kinds of animals that are not birds. One is that a lot of them are difficult to find. Here's a short-tailed weasel I saw near my home about three weeks ago. The thing is, this is only the third weasel I'd seen in my entire life. And even when you do find a rare, interesting animal that's not a bird, chances are it's not doing very much that's very interesting. Here's a porcupine, for instance, that Braden and I saw right down the road here in Lee Metcalf a couple of weeks ago. It was sitting up in a tree. When we showed up, do you think it started juggling or singing or telling jokes? No, it just sat there like a lump on a log. Fine, be that way. Birds, on the other hand, are not only everywhere you look, whether you're at a wildlife refuge like this or looking in your backyard or schoolyard, whenever you find a bird, chances are it's doing something very, very interesting. And that, hands down, makes birding Braden's and my favorite animals, group of animals, to go look for and watch. Before we get you started out on your own today birding and showing you some of the common birds around us, Braden would like to take a minute to make sure that you're as prepared as possible to have the most fun birding adventure you can. Hi, I'm Brayden Collard, and I've been birding with my dad since I was about 10 years old. One of the great things about birding is that you don't need a lot of equipment to get started. However, two things you need to get started are a good pair of binoculars and a birding field guide. A good pair of birding binoculars cost around two or three hundred dollars, and we know that you probably don't want to spend that much money when you're just starting out. So we recommend that you borrow some pairs of binoculars to figure out what kind you might like best. This will also allow you to learn how to use binoculars before actually getting your own pair. When you're out in the field, of course, you're going to want to identify the birds, and field guides were made exactly for that reason. There are all sorts of field guides that my dad and I have used, and they each have good and bad qualities. Our favorite is the Sibley Guide to Birds, and you can see we've used it a lot because the cover title has worn off. Unfortunately, this book is really large and heavy, but they do make good field guides of Sibley birds that are smaller versions that will fit in your day pack. Speaking of day pack, you have to be prepared whenever you go birding or do another outdoor activity. Make sure you have plenty of food and water so you don't get dehydrated or hungry, and make sure you always have a cap and sunscreen to protect from the sun. If you live in a place like Montana, you have to be prepared for the weather too, which can change in an instant. Always make sure you have a raincoat and a warm change of clothing. Make sure you always tell someone where you're going, and take a birding buddy with you if you can. And finally, if you have one, make sure to bring a phone for emergencies. Speaking of phones, the last tool I'd like to tell you about is an app by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology called eBird. eBird is this great app that allows you to record your bird sightings and find birds that others are reporting. My dad and I have spent thousands of hours looking at and exploring eBird, and it's a tool that really helps make the best out of your birding.
Something else that can make your birding experiences better are, is a camera, of course. Now, you don't have to get a fancy camera like this one, though it helps if you have one because it allows you to get close enough to birds to take a good picture. But even small cameras have amazing zoom features these days that will allow you to get pretty decent photographs of birds that are nearby. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, Photography is just a whole lot of fun, but second of all, often when Braden and I are out in the field, we're not sure what we're looking at. If we take a picture of it though, we can go home and we can compare that picture with Sibley's or some other birding guide and figure out what we saw. Now let's get out there and find some birds and learn to identify some of the most common species you're likely to see. Since we're already here at the refuge, let's start by looking for some birds that you're likely to see close to water. And what better bird to start with than the mallard? Mallards are easily recognizable because the males have bright green heads. They are far from the only kinds of ducks you might see in a watery place, however. Others include northern shovelers, which, like mallards, have greenish heads, but can be distinguished from mallards because northern shovelers have rusty sides and shovel-shaped bills. Gadwalls are one of the most common ducks and the blandest. Their gray bodies stand out along with their black behinds. American coots are often confused for ducks, but are actually related to a group of birds called rails. They can also be found in large numbers wherever you have ponds and lakes. Geese can also be confused for ducks. This is a Canada goose, by far North America's most abundant kind of goose, but it can easily be told from a duck by its large size and distinct black and white head. If you're really lucky this time of year, you might also see some white geese flying over. These are snow geese, and they can migrate by the tens of thousands to their northern breeding areas. Before we leave the water entirely, let's look at a couple of birds that can be found around ponds and lakes and rivers. This is one of my favorites, a red-winged blackbird, and they can often be seen staking out cattail territories around ponds and lakes. Many of you have probably seen great blue herons stalking fish in wetland areas, but if you see some up in the tops of trees, you're not imagining things. These big gangly birds often build their nest in treetops and actually work hard to defend their territories from other herons. But let's move away from wetlands habitats and explore some birds we'll see in other places. If you live near grasslands like Braden and I do, You'll be lucky to see western or eastern meadowlarks, which can easily be identified by the bright yellow and bold black patches on their breast. Two kinds of bluebirds you might see are western and eastern bluebirds. They can be identified by their kind of reddish patch on their chest. In this time of year, you might also be lucky to see mountain bluebirds down in valleys. They can be distinguished from western and eastern bluebirds because they lack the reddish patches on their breast. They're down here, of course, to fatten up on insects to help them prepare for nesting season. And that finally brings us to birds that you can see almost anywhere, including in your own neighborhoods. Raise your hand if you can recognize this bird. That's right, American Robin, easily picked out by that black head, and that big, bright orange chest. American goldfinches can also be found in many neighborhoods around the country. The brighter the bird, the healthier it is, a fact that comes in handy when you're trying to attract a mate. If you hear three longer notes followed by a bunch of shorter notes, you may be hearing a song sparrow, one of our easiest sparrows to pick out not only because it can easily be seen on the tops of bushes and fence posts, but because of that dark brown spot in the middle of its chest. Chickadees, of course, are some of America's favorite birds, not only because of their distinctive black and white coloring, but because of their famous chickadee-dee-dee -dee sound. 
There are several different varieties, including this black-capped chickadee, which is a frequent visitor to backyard bird feeders. And I'd be totally remiss if I didn't mention at least one kind of wood warbler. Dozens of kinds of warblers migrate through the country every spring, but the yellow-rumped warbler shown here is the most common and can be found wintering in many parts of our country. Moving on to larger birds, one of Braden's and my favorite groups of birds are the corvids, which include crows and jays. In fact, the American crow may be the most common corvid you'll see in many parts of the country. Both crows and ravens are larger jet black birds, but ravens have larger, chunkier bills and a much throatier call. Here in the West, we're lucky to have another corvid called the black-billed magpie which you can easily identify by its bold, bluish, and white markings. Watch a magpie or another corvid for a while, and you'll quickly discover that corvids are some of planet Earth's smartest birds. Are you hearing a tap, tap, tap around your yard? Chances are you're hearing a, can you guess? Yes, a woodpecker. This is a downy woodpecker, one of North America's most widespread woodpeckers. It looks a lot like its slightly larger relative, the hairy woodpecker, which is also widespread. A third kind of woodpecker you're very likely to see looks much different from downy and hairy woodpeckers. It's called the northern flicker, and it is enemy number one of a lot of very tired parents. Why? Because they get woken up to the sound of the flicker pounding and drumming on, its on your rooftop or your rain gutter. They are, of course, just trying to attract a mate, not trying to cause harm. And like all other woodpeckers, northern flickers eat insects. In fact, you may see these in your grass as they search for ants to gobble up. And speaking of predators, what better way to finish up our discussion of native birds than by looking at two of our most common raptors or birds of prey? This is a red-tailed hawk and is one of the most widespread birds of prey in our country. Red-tailed hawks come in many color patterns, but the dark brown head, dark belly band, and red tail of this bird is typical of the red-tailed hawks that you will see flying over where you live. The second raptor I want to show you just happens to be our national bird. Do you know what it is? That's right, the bald eagle. This one happens to be a juvenile, so its head isn't the pure white that you see in adults. But these birds are easy to recognize and widespread around the country now. They used to be endangered, though, just a few decades ago because of widespread use of a pesticide called DDT. Once DDT was banned, however, the populations of bald eagles and many other birds of prey have steadily increased. It just shows you that passing laws to protect our environment does great things for nature and our own health. Now, so far we've been learning all about native birds, but believe it or not, many of the birds around us were introduced here from somewhere else. You probably recognize the rock pigeon, a common resident of almost any city or town. It was brought to America by colonists in the 17th century and took over the continent as quickly as Europeans did. Today, they are so abundant that they have even visited my office skylight. <laughs> a more recent exotic introduction is the Eurasian collar dove, which can be told from native mourning doves by that black slash or collar at the back of its neck. These birds were released in the Bahamas in the 1970s and have conquered almost all of the United States in the past two decades. One of our most notorious and successful introduced birds is the European starling. About 100 individuals were released in New York Central Park in the 1890s. Today, more than 200 million of these birds live across North America. Starlings are classic examples of an invasive species, a species that is brought to a place where it doesn't belong and causes huge problems. Starlings have been a scourge for farmers, damaging millions of dollars worth of crops and even spreading diseases to farm animals and people. They also outcompete and displace native birds, a negative quality also shared by the common house sparrow. If you see starlings or house sparrows around your house, 
do your best to drive them away and make sure they don't have an opportunity to nest. Even if it might be fun to see a rose ring parakeet flying around the neighborhood, starlings and other invasive species are lessons for all of us that we should never ever release pets or other exotic animals into the wild. Braden and I hope you've enjoyed birding with us today. As you can see, we're back in our own home in Missoula, Montana, where, not surprisingly, we can see and hear a number of different birds, including black-capped chickadees, black-billed magpies, and violet-green swallows, which we didn't get to show you today. Even better, we get to be here with our dog, Lola. Come here, Lola. Oh, what a good dog here. We do have to apologize to you today, however. We promised we would show you 21 different kinds of birds. Instead, we've shown you 31 different kinds. But that just shows you how exciting birding can be. To learn more about birds and birding, check out my books and other bird books from your public and school libraries. If you just have to have your own copies, you can order them from your local independent bookstore or from Sneed store on Amazon. Teachers and librarians, a writing-based lesson plan and study guide to go along with this video is available on my website, www.sneedbcolorthethird.com. There you can also find more information about my books and the many presentations and workshops I offer during my author visits. Don't forget to follow our birding adventures on our blog, fathersonbirding.com, and check out my dad's other videos on his YouTube channel. With that, we only have one question for you. What are you waiting around for? Get, Get out, out there, there and bird! bird.